Please open your copy of God's Word with me once more as we continue our study in the, the 19th Psalm, Psalm 19. We're reading the book that reads us, something that we did say last week that we should repeat once again this morning. And it was the great glory of God that He's infinitely glorious in His being. And how you and I live either ascribes glory to God, that is, we recognize that He's glorious, or our life does not give God the glory that is rightfully His. But for the follow of Christ, those who are in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, we will be judged by God now and in the future judgment on whether those decisions or choices had the glory of God as the chief aim. But that judgment is not a judgment to eternal life or eternal damnation, but your life will be scrutinized by God, your deeds scrutinized by God, to see whether or not it was done with the right motive that is for the glory of the living God. And so if you are not evaluating your life and your life choices using the testing grounds that God has subscribed and prescribed to us, and that is the Scripture, then you unfortunately are not pursuing the glory of God. Uh, to pursue the glory of God comes centrally from His instruction to know how to live for God, as we even read in the Westminster Catechism uh, prior to beginning our service in an official sense. The testing ground for our life, our duty, our loyalty, our worship, our thanksgiving, and the glory of God is found in the Scriptures. Because the order of life and its decisions require the evaluation of the God who rules over your life. That being said, you and I can be confident in the Word of God. Your decisions, even now, must be evaluated confidently according to the counsel from Scripture. Because God's Word is truth. So you saw from last week, after seeing the glory of God in creation from Psalm 19... It was an exhortation for us to see it in you. We are outdoors. We can see it, the beauty and the glory of God's creation. And we noted in verses 1 and 2 of, of uh, Psalm 19 that God's glory is always declared. God's message through creation is evident. And thirdly, that God sets the sun to display His glory. And that is under the rubric of seeing God's glory in creation. That is, as the sun is, is one of the great majestic, visible uh, uh, indications of God's attributes, it gives glory to God. And then verses 7 through 9 was an explanation of God's glory in special revelation, that is, the Word of God, the Scriptures, what we have unfolded before us. And you can be confident that God's Word can lead, can guide, and also can sanctify you. And so, under the second point from last week, we said, let God's Word transform your life. Let God's Word transform your life. And we asked the question, why? And the answer to that question is because God's Word, it is perfect. And because God's Word is perfect, according to the first line in verse 7 of Psalm 19, it restores or revives the soul. The second part of verse 7 says, the testimony of the Lord is sure. So because God's Word is perfect, God's testimony, it matures by warning the simple-minded or the simple. And the simple people are most likely the category of our youth, our young people. But you can be actually older and still be simple because you, you have not grounded your life in the Word of God. You have not grounded uh, your decisions in the Word of God. You've lived life kind of ebbing and flowing according to the whims and the dictates of this world. So even if you are over the age of 15 and you're, you're higher in the age of the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s, it takes a humility from God to realize that, yes, I am actually that simple person. I do not know what I ought to know because I have not taken the Word of God to heart and applied it to circumstances in my life to let the Word of God be the truth and the testimony that warns me and admonishes me. We also said that because God's Word is perfect, that God's precepts or His direction for your life produces joy. And that was at the beginning of verse 8. It says, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. So there's a sense of joy or rejoicing with the precepts because God's directions are life-giving 
They are life-sustaining. They're also life-edifying. They're life-sanctifying. And they teach and lead to eternal goals and the future glory, which is eternal life. And so that is the blessing of God's precepts being right. And for the Christian, those who pass from death unto life, you rejoice in the word of God. You give thanks for the word of God. You're great, grateful for the word of God. There's contrition, but there's gratitude for the word of God because it produces joy. Because God's word is perfect, then at the end of verse 8, that second line, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. God's commandment is pure, and it is life-giving. It is life-giving. It is pure, and it is life-giving because it is perfect. And then it says in verse 9, it produces a, a fellowship with God and a life in harmony with His. Well, that's the first line in verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean. It is clean, enduring forever. So the purity of God's Word produces sanctification, the fear of the Lord. I believe that fear is the byproduct of what God teaches and what God imparts into our lives on a regular basis. It produces holy reverence and obedience toward God. So when God teaches us what it means to fear Him, it is pure. It is holy. The terror of man strikes a different fear. It is, it is a fear that paralyzes, but this fear imparts life and it imparts power to those who embrace its truths. But then, this is something that was so critical from last week. Uh, we said that God's judgment for life is final. That God is the final judge over how society, uh, how his people are to live before him. This is not up for speculation. This is not up for debate. Uh, I know many uh, skeptics and critics have stood over the word of God in judgment, but they fail to realize that God stands over them infinitely in power and judgment. And that is what this text is saying to us this morning, dear saints, that we must embrace with all that is in us by the grace of God that the rules or the commandments or actually the judgments of the Lord are true. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. And so the question is not a matter of should we obey the word of God it is knowing that God's word is the standard for our life and God is the ultimate judge of what is right and wrong, what is acceptable, not acceptable. Then the conclusion we should say as believers is that it is righteous in every way. It is righteous altogether. There is nothing in the sacred texts of scripture that God reveals about himself and his expectations that it is not righteous in every way. There's something that I want you to consider as we move on into the second half of this sermon uh, today is that when we look at the law of God, it originally began with the Torah for the Old Testament believers, but it began to, to move on and uh, the meaning and the significance changed as scriptures were added to God's divine revelation. And so what you have is the law of God, the word of God, God's instruction is kind of like the general idea here uh, that we can draw from this psalm in Psalm 19. That means it is the entirety of Scripture, the entirety of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. God is the one who judges whether or not this is from Him or not. We are not the judge. God is the judge. Therefore, we are to glean principles from all of Scripture. Our direct commands comes from the New Covenant stipulations in the New Testament, but we learn of God and His attributes from the Old Testament. And we learn great principles from the Old Testament, but even as we are looking at the Old Testament, uh, in this context, we're looking at it from a new covenant perspective, those who are in Christ. This is not legalism. This is a life that has been sanctified and set apart by God, and that is seeing God for who He is, His laws for what it is. Therefore, the response will be consistent with this revelation. When God reveals Himself from His Word, it does reveal your deepest need, but also it expresses His glory. And we're going to look at His deepest, your deepest need this morning, your deepest need this morning, and one of them is by way of exhortation from this text in verses 10 through 11. This is the third major point in our study, and it is love God's word beyond measure. If there's a principle to apply from this text, is to love God's word beyond measure. 
I do remind you as I, I provide these uh, for you, these principles, that it is the Spirit of God who brings the love of God into our hearts and a loving response to the Word of God. So this is not something that you and I can work up. It's an exhortation to participate in this divine work that God is doing to cultivate a love for His Word as we say we have a love for Him. And there are four truths from just this one in verses 10 and 11. And the first is this, desire God's word supremely. Desire God's word supremely. This is not one book among many great books. This is not in the Shakespearean category. This is supreme. It is supreme and it is worthy of our attention, of our affection, of our duty, my dear precious saints, have you read the Word of God and, and it looked to you just like plain words at times? And you drift from one thought to the next. And you're all over the continent. Your mind carried away, but not focused on the fact that this is sacredness before us. Why do you think it is so? It's because the natural mind cannot conceive what it means to love God and His Word. The natural mind cannot conceive what it means to enjoy the Word of God. The natural mind cannot walk away and be flooded with this truth. It takes the work of the Spirit of God for humanity to respond to the Word of God with joy. If not, it just becomes another agenda that you need to check off. But here, I pray that we desire God's Word supremely. Verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. So the initial conclusion from verse 10 as the psalmist evaluates special revelation, that is the word of God, what we have here, the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, it is that God's word is more desirable. Or it is something that you and I should long for above all written instructions because of what it offers. Think about what captivates your attention, what really drives you and what really stirs your passion, maybe a hobby. And think about the time you spend on your hobby. And it's your hobby. And then because you love that hobby so much, I didn't, you should love your hubby, but I'm saying not your hubby, your husband, but your hobby. You, you enjoy that hobby so much or, or that, that pastime enjoyment so much, you say, wow, what? what did you say? I lost track of time. I forgot how long that took. I was having so much fun. I did not know three hours had passed by. That's what the psalmist is saying here. You relish God's word so much that if you're not careful, if you don't set an alarm to stop reading the word of God. Now, I'm not saying you set the alarm so you can. It's not 15 minutes yet. All right, let me see. I guess I read another chapter. No, you, you love God's word so much. You have to set an alarm so you're not late for work or late for your appointment, because you will lose track of time, because the Word is something you cherish above all things. One of the reasons why you do is because the Word of God is an extensive but an inexhaustible record of the character and the will of God. It is a storehouse of God's wisdom that those who engage in the Word of God the most receive the most benefit. It is something that we, we need to pour into our, even our young children. Don't waste your time on frivolous things like some of us may have and still waste our time. Develop good, sound habits of reading the Word, of studying the Word, of engaging in the Scriptures as our Savior did among the wise men in Luke chapter 2. 
For several days, he's away from his family members, but he's so engaged in his father's business, so caught up with the word of his father, that his human nature was being cultivated and developed in his perfection, yes, to know the father deeply and to express his love for the father. But here in our society, we're taught to teach our children that it is okay to waste time and spend hours upon hours cheering, upon, cheering on their activities. The events in this world draws them away from God and his word. And then we wonder why. It's because in society there's an emphasis on enjoyment and entertainment, but not on the riches and the pleasure of knowing the God who has made you in his image. When they have a love and the desire of God's word supremely, their decisions will be consistent with the character and the will of God. They will avoid the pitfalls and the snares in this world. Their decisions will not be callous, but will be biblically calculated because they have spent a time enjoying and desiring God's word supremely. There's something that this text presents to us that we must understand, my dear brothers and my dear sisters in Christ. If you look at this text, it's, this, it's making a comparative analysis. There's a comparison going on between the word of God and something that is precious, gold or even fine gold. That is the most choicest of a commodity in that time, the most valuable commodity or possession in this time. Whatever you treasure the most. And of course, for our younger people, it may not be gold because when they're young, they're not always able to tell that $100 is much more important than a penny. And so they may not understand financial concepts, but just think about your most precious possession. It could be your toy. It could be something that you really enjoy, something you cherish. It could be your friendships that you think that are dear to you. It could be a television show. It could be anything that you feel really makes your day. The scripture says there's no comparison. There's absolutely no comparison. But, in this comparative analysis, as he's making this comparison, he's weighing something in this world and the word of God. Beloved, what he's saying there is that it is not a secret. It is not a secret that those who know the psalmist knows that he treasures the word of God. Your love for God and his word is not a private matter here. It's not a private matter. And we must understand that the psalmist is not endorsing being a show-off or Pharisee, because the latter part of this psalm is clear that he's not a Pharisee. He's not self-righteous, because there's a sense of humility in acknowledging his sin. But there's also this keen awareness that those who are on the outside knows that he desires the word of God above all things. And it is not a secret. It is known. It is known by the neighbors, it is known by those he worships with, that he loves the word of the living God. Well, why do you think that might be the case? It's because this is at the very center of his worship. This is the very core of his life. It is, it is what guides and establishes his conversations, his discussions, his interactions. It's the very thing that drives his motivation and his affection. So people know it. That guy there around the street, yeah, he, he loves the word of God. But why? Because he not only lives it out, but he declares it. He makes Christ known, and he's not ashamed of it. And when he looks at the world, when he looks, whether it be COVID or catastrophe, viruses, ailments, when he looks at the world, he looks at the world from God's point of view, from the scripture. It's not a secret. That he loves God in his word. I'm reminded what the scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 4. When Paul said that, Timothy, your progress in God's word will be evident by others. A love for God's word will make a visible impression on your life. And the more you know the word of God is the more you would want to talk about it. Why? Because God is altogether, altogether glorious. He's altogether marvelous. And when that infiltrates your heart, it will not be a secret. To the extent that your progress will be evident, it will be plain, it will be seen. 
What are some signs? Well, you cannot wait to read it. You long to obey it. It speaks life into your inner person and you know it's transforming you so that it's glorious. You're no longer the same. Day by day, you're progressively becoming less and less of what you were prior to salvation. You find joy in its instruction, even in its rebuke. You find relief in its comfort. And you're grateful that God's word chastises you. Nothing worse than having someone who says he's, he or she is your friend and can never tell you that something's wrong with you. Can never tell you, hey, brother, you got a big blot on your shirt. And can I tell you, brother, sister, there's a big blot in your heart. Can I help you? The word of God does that. But you'll be grateful in this comfort. Psalm 119, 72. Psalm 119, verse 72. Verse 72 says, The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. God's word, my dear saints, is eternally greater. It's ever reliable. It is an endless reservoir of truth. So when you love God's word beyond measure, desire God's word supremely. Secondly, enjoy the sweetness of God's word. Enjoy the sweetness of God's word. That's what the psalmist says here. If you notice in God's word in this text, the second line in verse 10, it says, sweeter, sweeter also than honey in the drippings of the honeycomb. Now the sweetness, beloved, it is a picture of the pleasant and abounding nature of God's word. It's pleasant and it is always overflowing in its sweetness. It is always sweet. And it provides the edification that you need because of its sweetness. But here the psalmist wants you to know that it is not a sweetness among other desirable documents or writings. Its sweetness is infinitely unique because of its source. Psalm 119 verse 103 says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Well, why is that so? Because the sweetness in honey are your most pleasurable meals. There's a sense in profitability when you eat, especially when you go out to eat at a, a fine restaurant. But the people who make the most profits are the ones in the kitchen and the owners. You may enjoy it for a moment, but they enjoy the, the profits of, of the overcharging for something really good. But yet, when you enjoy that meal, you would say, well, it was worth it. It was truly worth it. It is by far the best meal that I've had. Well, the psalmist is saying, even the sweetest or the most enjoyable meal that you've had cannot compare to the Word of God. Why, beloved? It is because it reaches down to the soul. It reaches down to the depths of your inner personality. And so the more you read, the sweeter God's Word becomes. Now, please be reminded that this reading of the Word of God is with the help and the enabling grace of the Holy Spirit. If you're reading with a sense of constant dryness, Boredom hits you. you. Feel like there's nothing there in the Word of God. Pray that the Spirit of God will work, but but also examine your heart to make sure that there is no sin involved. For those who read the Word of God regularly, should enjoy the sweetness of the Word of God. Will you have moments where you feel uh, drawn from it? Where you feel that you are stray from the Word of God? Yes, and it is always, always because of the struggles that we have with sin and temptation. But even that is resolved through the Word of God. So the cure is when you don't feel like reading the Word of God, take it up and read the Word of God. It is not about feeling. It is about your confidence that the Word of God has the answers for your soul and that your heart needs desperately because your faith is not in your feeling. Your faith is in the infinitely wise God. The more you read this, the power and the presence of God and the Holy Spirit 
the sweeter God's word becomes. I want you to see another element, though, from this sweetness. The sweetness from God's word also comes with healing qualities. It comes with healing qualities. Because sweetness is not only pleasant. Remember, it says that the law of the Lord is perfect, right? Restoring, reviving the soul. There's an element of that in the end of verse 10 with the sweetness. There's a satisfaction, but there's also a nourishment. There's a restorative element to it. That, that means there says that there is no pain, there is no sin, there's no discouragement, there's no past, there's no sadness, no disappointment, no struggles, no bitterness, no level of depression, that God's word is not sufficient to heal. That is sufficient to heal. Its sweetness consoles the broken. It can comfort the contrite. It can humble the boastful. God's word can strengthen the weak. It is the balm for the dying. Yes, it is the balm for the dying. It's so important that we recognize this, that the best antidote for, this, for a saint who is dying is to let them know what God's word says. It is not for them to watch their favorite show before they die, but for them to have a prelude to their master. If they need a preview, give them their preview of the Lord Jesus Christ before they see him in glory. It says that even for those who are at death's door, that God's word is the comfort for their soul. It prepares them to see Christ. It prepares the saints to see the glory of Christ. It tells them that the eternal weight of glory, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, far exceeds the present affliction so persuasively that their present affliction is light in comparison to the future glory. That comfort in death, that comfort in sickness, that comfort even in this conflict that we see in this world comes from the word of God and its sweetness It alone brings true and lasting healing. And you see more and more why the psalmist is confident in the word of God. He's confident that, that, yes, we're grateful to the Lord for, quote, specialists in this world. But the chief specialist, the chief surgeon of the soul of mankind is not our psychological world, our psychiatrical world. No, the chief surgeon and physician is God himself. The instruction that someone needs, no matter what their condition is, is not more medicine. It is not more treatment. The treatment they need, my dear saints, is the treatment for the soul. It is a treatment for the soul, for man's disappointment, man's longing, humanity's sickness, humanity's ailment has to do with their estrangement from God. They don't need less of him and more of the world's antidotes. They need more of him and less of the world's antidotes. The scripture says, give them the sweetness of the gospel. Give them the sweetness of comfort. Give them the sweetness of sins forgiven. Give them the sweetness of fellowship with Christ. Give them the sweetness of eternal life. Because the word of God is just that sweet. God's word is the remedy for that son or daughter bound in their sin and rebellion. It brings God's moral law and his perfect expectations before them. God commands us all to be perfect because he is perfect. And they recognize their imperfection. And you remind them that God's standard and God's law has not changed because of sin or the fall. It remains ever the same because God's standard are bound to his character, not your expectation. So whether or not young man, young woman, young boy, young girl, you think that God's expectation has changed because society has, it has not. His standards are perfect. And he demands perfect obedience to which your parents, your parents will never attain in this life. So they introduce to you and present to you the same mercy that they have received, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The same compassion and pity that was shown toward them, they display to you that you are, yes, son or daughter. Yes, you are that lawbreaker. And it is evident in your life. And you need a Savior. And you're not that Savior. 
dad and mom, they're not your savior because they needed the same savior. And when they turn from their sin, believing that they are totally 100% guilty and condemned in their sin and trusted in Christ, oh, what joy they found. And instead of the word of God and the law of God being bitter, it became day by day ever so sweet. Begin to heal and bind their wounds, bind their hurt, bind their discouragement and disappointment, and remind them that God cares for them. Give your brothers and sisters in Christ the sweetness and enjoy the sweetness. Love God's word beyond measure. And thirdly, on the loving God's word beyond measure, embrace God's warning about sin. Verse 11 of Psalm 19, it says, Moreover, by them is your servant warned. I do want you to notice carefully that the, the psalmist is saying, By them your servant is warned. And the end of verse 11, that he's making a reference to the entirety of God's revealed word. He's not saying some parts of it are helpful and other parts are not. Let's throw out some parts of the Bible that don't look to be true because science says it's not, and let's keep the rest that we think science accepts. Beloved, them, them there that you see in verse 11, yeah. them be all the Bible. That's all of the scriptures, all of it. To disbelieve anything God says, listen, to disbelieve, to disbelieve. Now, we may have struggles and moments of doubt, but to disbelieve what God says is to disbelieve God. And we are in that radical fight to mortify our practical atheism, where from day to day we disbelieve God in our sin. Because the sin against God believes one of the two things that God didn't really mean what he says, or God doesn't exist. And whenever we sin, that's the implication by our sin. That God didn't really mean what he says, or he doesn't exist. So we are in daily need of this encounter to radically attack our penchant toward disbelief. It says to embrace God's warning about sin. On all of God's warning. So therefore, God's word is a preventative blessing. It warns you that the way of the transgressor, you know that, right? The way of the transgressor is hard. It warns us. And we should embrace the warning that sin leads to death. It warns that your heart, yes, your heart, left as it is, is desperately wicked. It has an incurable condition. That only the Spirit of God can help. But it also warns the redeemed that those who are saved by grace, it warns us of the consequences of our disobedience. God's word graciously warns you and I that our love for the world is the very thing that holds us back from loving God and each other. But if we love the world, it says that the love of the Father is not in us. It warns of a place for the unbeliever the word of God is so gracious to warn the unrepentant, the unbelieving, the rebellious, when it's gracious and merciful enough to warn them that if you refuse to obey the good news concerning the life, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, for you, the sinner and unbeliever, God warns you that hell is not just a profane slang. Hell is a place reserved for the devil, his angels who rebelled, and all who refuse to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. God is merciful to warn you to flee from the wrath that is coming, to run to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't live on the pretense of your religious history. Trust in the righteous one, Jesus Christ, for your salvation. What a faithful God who warns us. It also warns the servant in Psalm 19 and the worshipers that your God is a consuming fire. That he will discipline his people when they refuse to obey. Because he wants them to be more like Christ. 
So God's word, it warns you, as it does the psalmist and God's people, by informing your conscience with biblical truth, for example, so that you may be trained in righteousness, so that whenever you enter into that danger zone of sin and trespass, or the sins you love will keep you away from God's word, God warns you from his scripture, warns you from the word, and also by his spirit, that that is not the way of righteousness. Embrace God's warning about sin. Embrace God's warning about your sin. Yes, your sins are many, but God's grace is superabounding in Christ. Fourthly, under loving God's word beyond measure, treasure God's word. Treasure God's word. It says at the end of verse 11, in keeping them, there is great Great reward. But beloved, why should you treasure God's word? Well, it is God's word, yes, it is from him, but you will avoid the pitfalls in life. You'll avoid the many snares in life. And so there are immediate rewards in this present life. There are immediate rewards even now. If you heed to the word of God, you avoid the pitfalls, the snares, the shame, the scandals. But there's a greater reward too, right? There's a reward that you can actually know God and know his will. It is, it is so gut-wrenching, even as we look at this world and, and see the events around us, that, that society is almost just groping in the dark and they think, they think that it's light. They think that that path of darkness is the right path. The shame, the hatred that we see, the bitterness, the unforgiveness, that we see, the animosity, the blame shifting, the rioting, the burning, the looting, has nothing to do with being mistreated. Because if a Christian has a proper framework of what mistreatment is, every time they look at the cross, they will say, I can say nothing. You talk about mistreatment, Oh, my dear saints, here is the Lord Jesus Christ. All things were created through him and for him. Here's the creator standing before his created people while they slander and mock him, while they accuse him and spit in his face, while they beat him and they worship him mockingly when they're supposed to worship him in adoration and fear. You talk about mistreatment. That every sin that you have committed, you are committed, and you will commit it by God's grace and nailed to the cross. You want to talk about mistreatment. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. We deserve nothing. He deserves all worship, all adoration, and he comes down to earth to deal with the, the mocking and the scorning and the ridicule. There's no humanity that's marginalized. Christ was the perfect one. But there, no matter where we stand, whether we're in poverty or we're in riches, we look at the cross in humility and say, I've been given a mercy that I don't even deserve. When you treasure the word of God, my dear saints, your reward is Jesus Christ. Your reward is the crucified and risen Savior. Your reward is the one who gave himself up for you. Your reward is to be loved by a God who's poured out his love upon you before the foundation of the world. That he chose you in Christ. Your reward is to know that you have fellowship with God and each other. So when you read the word of God, you're not thinking about social justice. You're not thinking about reparations. You're thinking about redemption for a sinner. Sinner. 
You think about a, a savior who was crushed by the father who loved him so dearly and he crushed to satisfy his wrath so that he may sanctify the rebel. That's treasuring the word of God. Because when you treasure the written word, you will treasure the living word. Oh, my dear saints, love God's word. You know the song, right? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Right? Look full to his glory and grace. And it says, and the things of this world. What does it say? Well, it says it's going to brighten up. No, it says it will grow strange. Stra you think of it, strangely dim. Surprising, but it is dim in the light of his glory and his grace. You gaze upon the word of God in his glorious light and might through Christ. And boy, the, the events in this world, the sins done to you, will grow strangely dim because your heart would be marvelously warmed by Christ. The final exhortation is in verses 12 through 14. We've just discussed love God's word beyond measure. And under that loving is to desire God's word supremely, enjoy the sweetness of God's word, embrace God's warnings about sin, and treasure God's word in verses 10 and 11. And verses 12 through 14, as we conclude this psalm, my dear saints, let God's word yield confession and petition. Let God's word yield confession and petition. But first, let me exhort you, just based on the principle of this text, but other passages that support this truth. And, and as beloved, engage in honest self-examination. Engage in honest self-examination. And that is the word of God, shining a light upon your own heart. Psalmist says in verse 12, who can discern his errors? And that is the psalmist's response to just the rising tide of God's word. Because as he's just read the word of God, the word of God is reading and exposing the deepest content in his own heart. This bringing him to a place of, of humility and brokenness. An acknowledgement of his humanity, of his sin, and that it is not right before God. So, beloved, at, at the end of every sincere, spirit-enabled analysis of God's word, and your condition is a response that draws from your heart your sins. Your sins, an acknowledgement, a confession of your weakness, of your sin, of your inadequacy. After every responsible study of God's word is, is acknowledgement of some sort, a recognition, something is done during that moment. That's what you find here. Well, think about the word of God in Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4, verse 12, primarily. If you look at that text with me, beloved, as you're turning there, it says, verse 12, for the word of God is living and active. The word of God is not a dull blade. It is living. It is God breathed. It is active. Sharper than any two edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It was someone who said that the word of God is so powerful that it will cut through all of your excuses. I mean, you have some, don't you? Would you like to share them with us? I didn't feel well today. That's why I said that. What do you expect? When I have a long day, I act out. I mean, that's, that's it. It's not sin. It's yeah, you know what happens when I get enough sleep. Yes. It's not sinfully angry. It's hangry now. 
I'm angry because I'm hungry instead of I'm sinfully angry because I can't thank God for the fact that I'm deprived for a moment to give thanks in my hunger. We got him. They're there. The word of God cuts through all of those things and lets us get a glimpse of our sin for what it really is. Listen, my dear saints, this is for us too. You will never taste the sweetness of the glory of God in a progressive sense if you are not willing to address and confront your sin. Now, there's a sense in which society can tend to overdo the excess of sin, 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 sin. They talk about their sinfulness, and, and then, but you, I just wonder, well, are you putting it off? This is not a dissertation of sin. This is an acknowledgement of sin so that we may put that sin off by the grace of God. But the word of God cuts through those things, those excuses. It is extremely effective. Of course, there's a sense in which in Hebrews 4, the idea has to do with judgment, that in judgment, that the word of God will cut through the chase. Yes, it will cut through the facade. There's some who can really look the part of a Christian, but they're fake. It cuts through all of that. And you all, we all should be grateful to God that preaching exposes hypocrisy and not glories in it. And to say that oftentimes we are deceiving ourselves into thinking that we're saved, but, but there's, there's no growing love for Christ or a hatred for our sin. The more we know the word of God is the more we tend to what? Excuse our sin. We, we say, well, it's buried under the cross. Yes, so mortify them the same cross. Don't leave the cross until those sins are mortified, which means you will, you'll be at the cross dying daily until the coming of Christ. Because that is what the word of God is doing. In fact, the idea of the word of God being living is extremely emphatic in the Greek. It's not some, some dead manuscript. It's living truth from the living God, speaking life to those who were once dead in their sin, but now alive in Christ. And it says it is active. This activity has to do with the transforming power of the word of God. So critical. It doesn't just cut through excuses. It doesn't just expose your sin. It sanctifies the saint. It is producing Christ likeness. So your ability to list your sins and your capacity to identify your sin is not just the sole work of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. It is so that you may become more like the Savior. It's transforming. The idea of it being sharper is the idea of being sharper above and beyond any double-edged sword. It exceeds that. So God's word as a text in Hebrews warns that his word is a very instrument that God uses to determine the validity of your faith, the authenticity of your faith, or the lack thereof. I mean, how often do you see the need to acknowledge your sins because you know all of your sins have been forgiven before God? But you acknowledge those sins so that you can put them off because God's word is just laying your excuses bare. There is no excuse for us to make with our sins but the fact that we're sinful. To acknowledge that, to be grateful that we have a Savior, but to put them off because the goal is Christ. The goal is Christ's likeness. The goal is sanctification. The goal is the glory of God. There's another analysis that I want you to think about this from Psalm 19 as we look at Hebrews 4 is that the word of God, it cuts both ways. It is, a, it is an offense against your excuses, but it's also an instrument of judgment. That every time you read the word of God, it's, it's in a sense saying something about you and your life. Now for the Christian, this is not eternal judgment to hell, but this is the day-to-day -day examination. 
And that is why we're saying engage in honest self-examination, because if you're engaging in the word of God, it will be nothing but honest self-examination. There's no such excuse as, well, you know, the Lord knows my heart. Well, yeah. What, what a profound reality. That's why he sent Christ. To work, to sanctify this heart that can be so wayward. It says in Hebrews 4, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, scripture cuts through the chase, it gets to the heart of the issue. You know, the world, when it deals with our problems, it deals with the external or the surface or the superficial. It begins by saying, yeah, it, it, yes, you're a product of your environment or you're a byproduct of your environment or something that was done to you. But the word of God says none of that is true because it says the sin comes from your heart. Your sinful reaction and what is done to you only exposes what's in the heart. The scripture cuts through all of that. And it reveals the sin, but also it reveals the remedy. So the scripture does not just deal with the external, it deals with the internal first, and then the external is conformed to that truth. Beloved, the point makes in Hebrews 4 is that the word of God reaches deeply into the heart of the Christian. It pierces. I mean, can you imagine having open heart surgery with no anesthesia? Just the doctor, you know, I'm going to cut you open. You're going to watch all the blood gushing. You see your heart in my hand. You'd be in shock. This this sanctifying treatment in Hebrews 12 is while you are watching it. While you are actively engaging in it. It's shocking, but it is true. God's word pierces to the veneer, the facade, the pretense. All the pretending that you may be doing spiritually, the fake spirituality, the fake Christianity, it cuts through all of that. Many a men, many women, many a preacher stood before the pulpit for years and were dead in their sin. But before they stood before a holy judge and were cast to eternal torment, God graciously opened their eyes to see that the word of God is not cutting. It's not convicting. It's not transforming them. It never was. But then when God saved them, what a love they had for the word. What a love for truth. Now, I say that there'll be patterns in your life where you don't have that. But, beloved, if, if you're consistently inconsistent with pursuing the word of God, that's a deep problem with the soul. If you're consistently inconsistent in the hearing of the word of God and responding to it, that's a problem of the soul. And the word of God is here to cut through the veneer, the facade. It's better to cut through it now. It's better to cut through it now. It's always best to confront your hypocrisy now because that is not going to stand in the day of judgment before God. So my encouragement is to turn from the sin that so plagues you of religious formality and trust in Jesus Christ. There is no room for that in the future judgment. But if God is judging you now as being that person, don't run from it. Run to the cross. He said, well, I'm afraid that people may know, my dear, my dear, my dear, the person you should fear the most is the fact that God already knows. And that is why his word pierces, because he knows those hidden secrets, those hidden sins are there. Those sins you love and crave. Secret lust, secret desire, secret pursues. He knows them. And that is why it says that it is discerning the thoughts and intentions of your heart, the end of Hebrews of verse 12 of Hebrews 4. Now, think about this. The idea for the word discerning is where we get the word critic from. This discerning is where we get the word critic from. God's word is the only pure and effective critic of your innermost thoughts and desires. It's analyzing them. 
See how much as you study the Word of God, to read the Word of God, and He brings those things to your attention. He's analyzing you. He's bringing those truths to you so that you may acknowledge them. Because He's the only one who can expose the sins that the natural eye cannot see. Whether it be disbelief, doubts, lack of trust, secret sins that you have in the closet. So that you may be brought to the point of true contrition for your sin. And place your confidence in Christ. At the end of the day, when you look at this, it is all settled. God, he truly knows those who believe in Christ and those who do not. And those who are obeying him and those who are not obeying him. Superficial obedience or surface obedience or obedience of appearance is not what pleases God. But that the heart, the heart that he's transforming seeks to please him. And going back to Psalm 19, verse 12. Who can discern his errors? It's the word of God. It's only the word of God. And that's what the psalmist is saying here. The word of God by the spirit of God. But then... As you let God's word yield confession and petition, thank God for justification. Thank God for justification. Thank God that he declares sinners righteous. God does not declare righteous people righteous because they are none. He cannot because they are none. No one is righteous but God alone. And so as you look at these passages, this, this is not legalism. This is not just an old covenant truth where the psalmist and, and the true converts and the true believers did not trust in God for salvation. They did. And justification is ancient because God justified Abram by faith. And so this is, this is still men and women who responded to the word of God knowing that they were justified according to God's promises and nothing that they have done. This is not self-righteousness. So you and I so thank God as we look at this text in verse 12. The end of verse 12, it says, Declare me innocent from hidden faults. And the only reason that God can declare you innocent is because of Christ. Because of Christ. There are some circumstances where this petition may actually be made by an innocent party, someone who's not guilty of the accusations, but that's not the situation here. The psalmist may be innocent when other people have charged him falsely, but when he stands before the word of God, he knows that he's not innocent. He'll never be innocent. He must trust in God's promises for his justification, but he recognizes the fact that it is not his innocence. It is not his righteousness. He's trusting only in the mercy of God. And that is what's happening here. So, beloved, after reading the Word of God, have you been cut lately by its probing truths? Because that's what you find here in this text. You don't find a sense of self-righteousness, but thorough self-examination. Thorough uh, petitioning to God. Recognizing that God is the one who justifies. He says, acquit me of this. Declare me innocent. Now, what are these hidden faults here in this text? Well, hidden faults are the sins that you hide. The hidden sins, you keep them tucked away from everyone else. Now, there is a sense in which there's a wisdom in not telling everyone everything. Right? But you should have some brothers and sisters in Christ that you can confide in and let them know. Brothers and sisters that you trust, that trust is, is built in a relationship over time. Because it is true, some people just can't be trusted. But you find people you can trust, can, you can tell them something, and it is, it's confident. Unless that pattern of sin continues and you refuse to repent of it, then they have to get the church involved eventually after going through Matthew 18, speaking with you, taking another witness with them. But there should be a sense of confidentiality in, in someone Wanting to grow, but struggling. But here, our hidden faults are the ones that we just won't bring up. 
Well, why is that a case? Well, it's a possibility that you and I may prefer to look righteous and have those life-dominating sins prevailing over us. In your heart, you know that you're concealing the sin. But the problem is, among many, God will not pardon the sinner who smothers his or her own sin. Those who confess their sins are truly blessed. The psalmist says in Psalm 103, verses 3 through 4, Psalm 103, verses 3 through 4, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who can stand? But with you there's forgiveness that you may be feared. That's encouraging. Because the fact of the matter is you, you may have doubts about some things, but you should have no doubt about the fact that you do have sin. It is so good that the mercy of God is there. With him there's forgiveness because he's a merciful God. So my dear saints, thank God that you're justified, but in justification, don't cover your sins, don't excuse them. Lay them open before God. But thirdly, appreciate God's exposing of your sins. And that's the third under letting God's word heal confession and petition. In verse, uh, verse 13, appreciate God's exposing of your sins. He says, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. I do want you to know, though, in verse 13, at the heart of presumptuous behavior, this conduct is pride. It is pride. There's a sense in which you are exceeding the boundaries that God has set, committing premeditated sin, something that you plan to do. And many of men who say, well, you know, I didn't know that would happen. I just stumbled onto it. No, you didn't. The, the moment you turned that computer on, you were entering into that with a premeditated attitude. Sin just doesn't happen out of the blue. Oftentimes, these sins that we commit are committed with intent. There's presumptuousness. There's pride there. Or you may plan to do something that is wrong or devious. Now, you will say, well, God will forgive me for it. Will he not? So I can sin, and he'll forgive me. You know, what it does is that attitude suppresses God's word in your heart. The truth of God being revealed in that moment is suppressed, not because God's word is powerless, it's because you're being judged by God. Remember, whenever we suppress God's truth and the righteousness, God is not himself in heaven saying, oh, oh, man, wow, they're powerful people. No, suppression of truth is a consequence of your sin. God's judgment and turning people over is a consequence of their sin. What is the remedy? It's to flee that sin like Joseph did. Flee it. Know that you have been given the power of God's Spirit to resist and sneer and to pursue righteousness. And here in this text, is, the attitude at this point is not, you don't want to just get off. You don't want to quit. It's not forgiveness, per se, that you seek, which you do want that. It's that the ultimate goal here is that you want that sin to die. Do you like to make calculated sins? Do you do them? You say, well, no harm, no foul. You say, well, let's just do it until they say something. Or as one famous person said that you don't know. It's better to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission. That's presumptuousness in your sin. But we do that. Once again, we don't know the depth of our sin because we love it. And it's normal to us. Are you hearing me, saints? I'm saying this for your good. Your sin is normal. It's sad, but it's normal to you. So the, some of the things that we do, slyly or underhandedly, it's normal. The psalmist is not saying, I know you forgive me, I'll be quick. He says, I want them to die because they're there. I want them to be mortified by your spirit because they're there. Deceptive, drawing, conniving, deceitfulness, I know they're there. I don't want them just to be covered. I want 
them to die. So that I do not become deliberate in my sins any longer, but determined to please Christ even more. Appreciate it, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, because when God exposes those sins, it's a gracious mercy because we won't see them because we are used, we are acclimated and used to doing them. Appreciate God's exposing of your sin. Is he doing it now? Give him thanks. Are you convicted now? Praise God for conviction of sin. But remember, cast it on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hate that sin. If you don't think you hate it enough, ask God for holy hatred, for the strength to continue by his Spirit's power to fight that war against that indwelling sin so that you may be more like Christ and glorify God. Fourthly, my dear saints, be deliberate in prayer. Be deliberate in your prayer. In that the words of your mouth, in verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And here's someone who's being sanctified in the truth, by the truth, and through the truth of God's word. The idea here, just to give you a very brief summation, uh, is that the focus is on your thoughts, your emotion, and your will, which means it's the totality of your person, all of you. That everything you do, you don't just want your words to square up with the word of God, or to line up with the word of God, or to be in agreement with the truth. You want your heart and your thoughts to do the same. So it's not the articulation. It's not just the verbiage. It's not just the Christianese. But it's living it out with both thought, intent, and action. That everything is in harmony with the work of God's Spirit in your life. It is not just about being able to say the right stuff. It's that the right stuff is having an impact on your heart, your will, and your emotion. That's a deliberate prayer. And here the blessing of the saint is that we have the Spirit of God who enables us to do this. Who gifts us with the grace to do so. But the goal is not that we may be pleasing to man or to impress others, but that it may be acceptable before the presence of God. What reverence, what insight the psalmist has reached by God's grace to see that after viewing God's world book in creation and then his word book in divine revelation from the scripture, he reaches the height and the recognition of his humanity. And he prays that God would enable him to speak, to think, and to live in such a way. And listen carefully, my dear saints, that God may be pleased. That God may be pleased. At the end of the study of the Word of God, it was once again, it's still the glory of God. Not the impression of man, not people being impressed by you, but the glory of God. To which only he knows whether or not you and I are truly giving him glory. If you're not in the Lord Jesus Christ, this text cannot apply to you unless you have been born of the Spirit. Until Christ is Lord and Savior of your life, every exercise in righteousness is an exercise in greater condemnation without Christ. Our plea is to always remember your sin, that you're guilty. Remember the Savior, the guiltless one, the innocent one, who offered his life up as a ransom for you so that you may have eternal life from God, from above, fellowship with the Savior, forgiveness of all of your sin, the joy of a fellowship with fellow saints as we long and look for the appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.